it's funny what your brain remembers. When I thought of the theme, journey, I remembered when I was a boy in Belmond, Iowa, there was a men's quartet that came and sang at Trinity Lutheran Church in Belmond where my father was the pastor. And they sang an upbeat gospel song that started like this. Well, it wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Got to make it to heaven somehow. Though the devil tempts me and tries to turn me around. He's offered everything that's got a name. All the wealth I want and worldly fame. I wouldn't take nothing. Nothing for my journey now. How many of you are old enough to remember that gospel song? Okay, there's four of us, and that's good. (laughs) It's a song about life being a journey. But it's also a song about the last journey that a human being takes when they breathe their last in this world and go on to what has been promised for all of us in the name of Jesus Christ. That's good, isn't it? But I want to say to you that life is not only a journey, But faith is a journey. Why is faith a journey? Because we are the people of God. And God is by virtue of his his, uh, be God, but also by virtue of Jesus, who was dead but raised from the dead, burst out of the tomb Easter morning, God is loose and actively alive at work in our world. And if God is loose in his primary category of character revelation is love love is always active and flowing it's like the current of a river or it's like the flow of electricity and god is always on the move and love always reveals itself in active expressions of service and sensitivity and forgiveness and kindness and embrace And so if we're going to be the people of God and God is loose and always at work in love and on the move by his spirit, unfolding history toward his desired end, and we who are his people aligning our lives with his will so that we can participate as the partners of God in building the kingdom of God, then we're going to be people moving with God by faith Therefore, faith has to be a journey. So one could even say that by faith, and I align my heart in the yielding of my will to the Holy Spirit, it's as if I dance with God's presence through the journey of life. I dance in the light of His love. I align my life with his purposes, and I seek to understand what God desires of me, where God is at work in the world, and I'm going to follow that so that I can serve the greater purposes of God. Now in the lessons that were read, we heard, remembering from Genesis 12, God's promise to Abraham. I want to remind you that when God made Abraham that promise, he was living in what would now be called Iraq. But God said, I want you to leave your land where you live and I will lead you on a journey to a place that I will show you. So Abraham, the one we call father of faith, lived his life in obedience to God's call by making a journey. A journey of faith. And here's my question that I've been stirring in my own spirit this week. If I'm going to follow God to the place that he wants to lead me, and I'm going to follow God to receive and embrace the promise he has for me, what do I, Lee Lovig, need to let go of or leave behind me in order that I can be obedient to follow God. Because I guarantee you that every individual life has stuff in our life that hinders or encumbers us from obediently following God's leading. So as those who are God's people journeying in this world by faith, 
I want you to ask God that. What do I need to let go of God or what do I need to leave behind me if I'm going to fully walk toward the full promise of the life you have for me or the purpose of serving you in this world. It isn't just Abraham that made a journey of faith. You remember Moses had to go back to the place of failure in order to say yes to his call of God and God used Moses and the people of Israel to journey through the wilderness for 40 years until they did enter the promised land. And you also remember, every time Jesus called one of his disciples, what did he say when he called them? He said, follow me. He didn't say, hey, come hang out with me. I'm going to stay right here. Jesus had a mission. He had stuff to do. He had lives to touch. He had people to love. He had miracles to do. He had a cross to pick up. And so he was on the move. And every disciple that followed Jesus was on the move with him. Faith is a journey. So where are we going on this journey? Well, you could say, I'm going to the promised land. Or we could say, as we've been referring to on All Saints Sunday, I'm going to heaven. And certainly that is our eternal destination, isn't it? But I want to add to you the image that it's not just a geographic location or a spiritual purpose, but that there is an inner matter of the journey as well. So I invite you to join me on a journey to an ever deeper love for Jesus Christ. How does that work? Well, I need to bring myself to the places where I can encounter Jesus together with his people. I can read his word and know his promises to me. I can read the stories of Jesus and understand more fully who he was. I can understand why I am his child. And I, in hearing, he forgives this foolish man who stumbles often. I am more indebted to him. I'm more grateful to him. And yes, I'm more in love with him. So I'm also on a journey, though, to embrace the character of Jesus. So we read those verses from Colossians that we would have compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. How are you doing with a Christ-like character in your journey. You see, it's not only where you're going, but who you are as a person while you're making the journey. An ever deeper love for Jesus, a character that reflects the heart of Jesus Christ as I go to discover God's purpose in my life. I don't know if a lot of people, even those who profess faith on a daily basis, pray to understand or know the will of God. God, what do you have for me? What am I supposed to do with you and for you today? What's your will in my life? Faith is a journey. Ultimately, the journey of faith for we who believe in Jesus is to go wherever Jesus leads. And I don't know where he'll lead you. And I don't know what stuff in your rhythm of life needs to be dumped so that you can be free to become Christ-like. But I know that he knows. And I know that he whispers to you the truth of what that is. Wherever Jesus leads, that's where we're journeying. In the verses that Barb read for us out of John 13, fresh on the heels of him washing all the disciples' feet, he said, and by the way, wasn't it interesting, it said, after he had gone. Who's he? Judas. After Judas had gone, something was set in motion like a row of dominoes headed toward the purpose 
the whole purpose for which Jesus had been born, lived his life, and obeyed God to come. That was the cross. Did he say almost sadly under his breath, well, I'm going to die now? No. What does it say? He said, now is the moment for the Son of Man to be glorified. What do we associate glory with? Achievement, victory, success, accolades, praise. But Jesus said the most powerful moment in the history of the world to bring glory to God the Father is when the Son of God, as the perfect Lamb of God, said, I will give my life for you. That's glorious. Then if faith is a journey, I'm following Jesus to the cross. And I'm going to ask God's Spirit to put to death in me all that hinders from God's way in my life. I'm going to ask that God put to death in my selfish spirit the thoughts and attitudes and behavior patterns that make it difficult for the light of Jesus to shine through me as his saint. In order for that to happen, for me and you both to make the journey of faith, we're going to do it together. It's a journey meant to take together. So on this All Saints Sunday, I want to start out by lifting up what we've already said about five times, which is we make that journey in the company of those who have already gone before us. So I want you to, in your mind, think about who it is you follow in your life journey that impacted your awareness of God or your understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who helped you? Who helped you know Christ? Who gave you an image of the integrity of faith that blessed your heart so that something inside of you pulsated and said, I want to be like that man who with integrity lives his life as a servant of Jesus. So I still have my dad speak to me on the journey. Do you have those voices? <laughs> in your head, of those who've gone before? Do you have those moments where someone who's no longer living on earth says something powerful about your giftedness or your heart or your abilities or their desire that you also be a person of faith? I guarantee you, you have those people. Maybe it is a preacher. Maybe it's a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it's your grandma that got on her knees every day and asked the Lord's Spirit to anoint your life. I don't know who it is, but we journey with the saints. They're not gone from our lives. They're alive with God. How do we journey? Jesus said that we're to love one another. There's a story I read this week of a man who came to his pastor and apparently their marriage was struggling. And he said to the pastor, I've loved my wife, I've given of myself, I've given of myself, I've made sacrifices, I've given of myself, and nothing changes. And the pastor said, good. The man got a puzzled look on his face and he said, now you understand that to love another human being is a labor of love. It takes work to love other people. Usually in America, we think about love as a feeling that is evoked because of a fondness or an affection for a person. And if I feel no fondness or I'm not drawn to a person, I am absolved of the call of God to love them. The trouble is, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. He loves us unconditionally. He loves us warts and all. 
He loves us even when, as we said with the children, our behavior's not very good on a given day. He doesn't stop loving us. And the way he calls you and I in the body of Christ to love each other is not based on whether we all love the cyclones or like classical music or love to go hang out in a certain location. He says that we're to love each other like he loved us. My capacity to love is very limited. So how am I going to keep loving you if it's not based on feeling? In fact, how are you going to love me when my true character of being an idiot shows itself? How are you going to do that? It takes a dependency upon Jesus Christ and the honest prayer before God. I can't love this individual unless you fill my heart with a capacity to continue to serve them and show them kindness. And oh, by the way, also to forgive them. I can't love like Jesus unless I'm willing to sacrifice myself and forgive them. Realize that Peter and Judas were among Jesus' disciples. So when Jesus knew that Judas or Peter were messing up, his love for them did not stop, and he didn't kick them out of the discipleship group. In fact, flawed Peter was the one that he said, Peter, you're my rock. I'm going to build the church on you. So he calls for us to love and to forgive. Some of you know that I have a big yellow lab that I adopted last April named Lars. Lars is hungry, 90 pounds of muscle, and he loves to go behind our home where we've got kind of a marsh in uh, CRP ground, marshy meadow. Well, one day Lars drug up into the yard the carcass of a decaying rabbit. He was so proud, it stunk, and it was dripping still. He didn't care. That was his prize. Took it into his dog run, and the first opportunity I had to try and get it away from him, I put on a glove, picked up that rabbit, and I hurled it back into the marsh. You know what he did next time he was in the marsh? (laughs) His nose found that dead rabbit. I thought, well, I'm going to show him. I walked 75 yards in a direction that he usually doesn't go and threw that rabbit as far as I could. Next time he's out in the marsh, Lars found that rabbit. And one day it occurred to me, I finally wrapped it all up in about three paper bags and threw it away in the garbage. But one day it occurred to me, I'm like Lars, and so are you. I have a nose for sin. I have a nose for stuff that stinks, that makes me sick, that leads me on a path that is not healthy, that is not appropriate as a saint of Jesus Christ. And no matter how God, by his Holy Spirit and through the word, says, Lavig, you shouldn't do that. Lavig, that doesn't honor me. Lavig, that violates the people that you love. Lavig, that doesn't bring glory to my name. My nose finds the dead rabbit. And I won't let it go. And I drag it back to my house. And it stinks the place up. Jesus says, love like I love you. Jesus says, forgive like I forgive you. I hope that in my life and yours, eventually we stop chasing the dead rabbit and say, God, you can have it. I don't want it anymore. So we make this journey together with an interdependence and a synergy of energy that lets us accomplish more for Christ together than we could individually. Yes, that dog is getting a drink with the help of his little friend there. 
There's an interdependence between us that helps us effectively serve Jesus Christ. We make more powerful witness for Christ together than we do individually alone. Many of you know that Faith Lutheran has sponsored mission trips every year since we started. The first year, there was a group, raise your hands if you went to Haiti. There was a group that went to Haiti. What's interesting about the group that went to Haiti is we were very diverse in our abilities, in our character, in our interests, but we came together as a team under the leadership of Eric, and we built stuff, and we shared the love of Jesus with children in an orphanage, and we worked together, and we had an adventure. But then there was a group that went to St. Louis. How many of you went to St. Louis? Quite a few of you. And you remember how together you sought to serve Jesus Christ in a region that was poor and impoverished. And the blessing that you had to other people. Then there was a group that went to Kansas City. How many of you went to Kansas City? Awesome. Thank you for that. So again, there's a group of people journeying together in the diversity of the giftedness with a mission to bless people in the love of Jesus Christ, to make an impact for the kingdom of God. That's how Jesus intended for us to be as a congregation, that we come together to be refilled with the Holy Spirit, to be re-clarified in our vision and purpose of life as we are the people of God. And then when we leave this place, there goes the body of Christ journeying together on a mission to impact people with the love of Jesus Christ. It's a strategy that Jesus has for building the kingdom of God. One of the ways that we would do that is in the relationships circling up in prayer. We say that we're a praying congregation, and so we are. We should be coming together to intercessory prayer, to praying for healing, for praying for our congregation, to praying for your foolish Norwegian pastor, praying for what God would have us to do together. But I also say that we should buddy up. Everybody needs a buddy. We should buddy up to intentionally come together in friendships where we specifically commit to grow together in Christ. Wouldn't that be awesome if, look around the room, if uh, three months from now we all raise our hands and said, I have a buddy and I've committed to grow in Jesus Christ together with my buddy. And we're meeting every month or we're meeting every other week or we're meeting every Monday at 6 a.m. I don't care, but as buddies in Christ, we're going to encourage each other to be faithful to Jesus Christ. Or we're going to meet as small groups. How many of you saw the movie Woodlawn? Okay, I don't want to spoil the plot line for those of you who haven't seen it, but it's a movie about a period of intentional integration of races in Alabama in the 70s. And there was a football coach that was bewildered by the fact that after an evangelist shared about Jesus with his football team that was racially mixed, that the only place in the school where blacks and whites got together was on his football team. And it culminates in uh, a high school championship football game and two of the athletes on opposing teams eventually went on to play for the University of Alabama. Bear Bryant. It's a powerful movie. But it's really a movie about the power of men and women or young people coming together and in a mutual commitment to Jesus Christ, having their lives and behavior and attitudes toward others changed because they are the saints of God. I want to end with a story, and she's sitting here, and I'm sorry, Barb, I didn't even ask your permission. But this week I called Barb Inge on the phone. She had had surgery about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, Barb? And I had 
not been able to get to the hospital when she was there, and I frankly, for a number of days after her surgery, forgot that she had had surgery, and I hadn't visited her, and I called her on the phone, and I thinking about, well, I'm the preacher, I got to minister to her, right? So I called her, and Barb, in a cheery voice, said, oh, that's okay, I've got my small group. She said, they have prayed for me before surgery, We have encouraged each other in the word of God. They've been texting prayers to me, texting words of encouragement to me. I know that they love me and that they're praying for me. And then she didn't say it, but she basically was saying, I don't care if you call me or not. (laughs) I got my small group. We're on a journey of faith together. No one should journey alone. We need to buddy up. We need to group up. We need to love each other. Yes, we need to forgive each other. But won't the adventure of following Christ together be exciting? Amen?